Welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's show is brought to you by Herman Marshall Whiskey, Dallas County's first distillery of handcrafted award-winning small batch whiskey, patiently aged in new white oak barrels in the great state of Texas. Built from the grain up, just like good whiskey and better friends should be. They have a bourbon, a rye, and a blend, and they are also building a brand new facility that should be opening sometime this spring, so you guys get a chance to check it out. Please do so, because this is some good stuff, especially this time of year with the cold weather. Nothing better than a little bit of warm whiskey. And welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's guest played for a lot of teams, made a name for himself all over the place. And now he does some TV and he was fortunate enough to be nicknamed the Doctor of Defense, Mr. Mark McLemore. Mac, how are we doing, sir? I'm good, bro. How you doing, man? I, I'm good. I'm good. This is that time of year, right? We start to get that itch. When we were playing, of man, spring training being what, less than 30, day, 30 days away. Starting away. to snow. Yep. That's, about, that's about close. Yeah, that's right. Snow in the grass now. Whenever the grass gets cut, we you know it's time for spring training. Yep, and that's what it is. People always ask about that itch. When when do you get it? I said, well, that when that season ends, right? It's it's October, November. You don't want to see anybody again for a few months, right? And then all of a sudden, January hits, and it's yeah. it's like a switch goes on. Now we're ready to go. So it's you know it's a little bit different for us being position players, but as pitchers, I mean, I don't know when they start doing it. I did. I started about January of just I wouldn't pick up a batter ball to January, right? And we go out and. And go, right? And then the pitchers, who knows what they were doing? But, you know, we didn't have the World Baseball Classic either, right? Which is another thing coming up. So it's... Yeah, you know, for me, yeah, for me, I would start probably about December 1st, depending on if I had gone to the playoffs that year or not. So uh, I went to the playoffs about five times in my career. So that would push it back maybe the middle of December. I'd start doing some running, some light throwing, light swinging from both sides of the plate. And then January 1st, like you said, that's pretty much when I got into that routine and trying to be ready by February 1st. I didn't try to get ready uh, before, you know, up to spring training or in spring training. I would want to be ready as close as I could possibly be by February 1st. Yeah, it's I mean, so as as a player, right, our bodies, we put we base it off of the previous season, how we would how we would react, right, what we would go through and stuff. So, you know, your first year was what? I got my cup, my first cup of coffee in 1986 with the Angels. So it was a September call up, and that was an introduction to a new world. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> but it, it was fun. So in, in, in the years that you played, you know, starting in in that, and you know, playing for for two through two different decades, three different decades, 80s, 80s, 90s, and and now today, kind of like the music. But so, what did you, you know, what changed from the beginning? to to the end of your career i mean i know with with age and stuff but oh, wow. did things change as far as uh, you know i know they've there's improvements in nutrition and but you look at both of us mark we're we're nutritionally enhanced right we were built for comfort not speed type of thing so what so, so <laughs> wait 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 i used to be built for speed but i am definitely built for comfort all the way 100 percent comfort now i've got my winter coat on i am well padded a lot of vitamin F going on right here, man. So uh, <laughs> I don't know about you. I had speed at one time. No, I was just out there. Just uh, like I said, I'm, I'm a comfort guy, and I was always built that way. So, so what changed as you progressed for through? So, what, what was your total service time in, in the major leagues? Uh, about 19 years. Okay, so what? So, <laughs> that's a lot. Of- uh, yeah, a lot of stuff changed, man. A lot of things changed. I remember the first time going into big league camp. I was 19 years old. And one of the veteran players with the Angels uh, was, uh, his name was Rob Wilfong. And man, as soon as I walked into the clubhouse, I smelled cigarette smoke. And I was like, that can't be coming from the clubhouse. That's, you're not supposed to smoke when you're a professional athlete. I walk in there, sure enough, go around another corner, and there he is with his smag just going at it. And I'm like, oh my God, he's going to get in trouble. So uh, now, mind you, I'm 19. I don't know what it's like to be in the big leagues where you can do whatever it is that you want to do. Just be on time where you're supposed to be, where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be there, and play hard. But as a 19 year old, 
Uh, I saw that. I smelled that cigarette smoke. I was like, he's going to get in trouble. Doesn't he know he's not supposed to smoke? Uh, but it was me. They didn't know that big leaguers could do pretty much whatever they wanted to. And that's, and when did, when did the cigarettes actually leave the club? I wonder, cause we know as, we, as Ooh, when I was playing, they yeah. were there, but they were kind of, you, you were outside more stuff. I mean, I mean, that's a big yeah. change for people, right? That was a huge change because a lot of guys smoked that, you know, and I didn't know that because in the minor leagues didn't find too many guys that were, you know, smoking. So uh, when I got to the big leagues, man, it seemed like everybody did. So I don't really know when it changed when cigarettes got out of the dugout or out of the clubhouse. Um, but I don't think it was too much longer after that. So that was around 85. Yeah. About 1985 was my first big league camp. So did you ever man, smoke it, with it, them? It left. Did you ever smoke with them? No, I was never a smoker and I was never a shoe guy. I, I tried it one time. I think it was my first week of pro ball when I was in winter ball and being 17 years old, you better believe uh, the first time I tried it, I got sick and that was it. <laughs> never tried it again. <laughs> yeah. I was a little baby and I was like, why would anybody put this in their mouth and leave it? Don't they understand what this tastes, you know, what this tastes like? And so I never had that issue again. Never wanted to. Never brought it up. I would just always look at guys with their, their big old chew in there and the wad in their pocket and the skull can back there and all that stuff. And I was like, I, I just don't understand it. That's when they used to hand it out, right? In the clubhouse. It, it, it'd yeah. just be here left and right. See, I was I was kind of like you. So when I was a kid, I'd probably five or six. My brothers gave me, they put a, a big fat wad of dip in my mouth when I was five or six. And man, I don't even remember anything after that. But I do know now if I even <laughs> smell it, Dip, just dip. I start to, I'll just start to just hit that little buzz and almost want to pass out. But chew, yes, I, I would do chewing tobacco, but only um, during batting practice. I'd always be afraid in a game if I have a chew and I'm running. You know, you get that, and you just swallow a little bit, and then you're, you know, you dry heave on the field. You're <laughs> you're trying to run, but other guys, man, they lived and died by it. So I mean, that that's another thing that, that kind of went away from the game now too, right? Was you know, tobacco and and. Uh, even alcohol too, right? It's not prevalent in the clubhouse now, um, like it was when we were playing. But you know, we're grown men; we should be able to make our own decisions, right? And, and they want to, yeah. and they want to change stuff from us, right? If, you know, I had, I had a hard day at the field. I want to have, I want some whiskey, right? I want a cold beer. I don't want some gluten free protein yeah. shake with you know with nuts and olive and whatever in it. I want something good, right? That's that's just how we are wired. So what would guys do then yeah, see, for their protein stuff, you know, back in, in the 80s, early 90s? What would they do? Protein? Uh, that was not in the clubhouse. No. Uh, you know, the liquor went away. That didn't really upset me. I was just kind of wondering why, because I know, you know, some of my teammates, you know, like to have a six-pack after a game, sit around the ballpark and talk and, you know, carry on. I was upset when they got rid of the junk food, to be honest. <laughs> When they took all that out and started replacing it with the protein bars and the shake, <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I need my junk. Uh, you know, so that was a little upsetting. But, you know, there's so many things that change from uh, nutrition. Uh, the game itself, I mean, the actual playing of the game on the field is very different than what it used to be. You know, a lot of the unwritten rules are no longer there. There are no longer rules. Um, so it's kind of Man, I, there's a long laundry list of things that change. Uh, how guys prepare themselves in the off season, from what I understand and from what I see, most guys don't even take an off. Don't even take time off when the season ends. They want to. They continue to work out throughout the course of the season or the off season. And man, that, that that's that's a little different because the guys that were before me, they never worked out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they used spring training to get in shape and get ready for the season. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, when my era came around, that's when guys were getting ready, you know, in November, December, and, you know, starting in or January, most guys started. Uh, so those are just some of the things that have changed, man. But while well, there've been so many changes in this game. Yeah. I remember uh, Rusty used to have those. Remember we used to have the little bags with the Rangers that, you know, go out, you know, have your glove, your batting gloves and stuff in it. Yeah. Rusty's would be full of candy. And I would be digging yeah. through that thing during stretch. All he would get some because he was trying to quit smoking. I think at the time he would have <laughs> probably eight or nine of those uh, nicotine patches on and everything else. And that's mm. what the, <laughs> the candy thing. And he would get so pissed at me. And that's yeah. where that whole Shrek thing started was when I started eating all his candy. So he, so right. But, but you're right though. That candy was just part of who we were. You know, we weren't worried about 
you know, our bodies trying to. I think nowadays guys are almost too lean, right? What's, you know, the old adage, you can't pull fat. But, you know, these guys, they come in, it seems like they're, they're always, they're overly lean, right? Your body needs a rest, a break. And like you said, these guys don't take a break. You know, if, yeah. would, would today's I, yeah. guys survive uh, back yeah. in then, back then in the, in the 80s when you were first coming up? Would these guys survive today? Uh, no, they'd probably get embarrassing because they would definitely get ridiculed. They'd be brought up in kangaroo court, all of that. But, yeah, I, they've got to be able to give – you have to give your body a rest. It cannot just keep going 24-7 throughout the course of a year. Every single day you're working out, you're doing – you know, and then be, there, be as productive as you can be. Uh, during a a major league baseball season there has to be some time for your body and more importantly than your body your mind to shut down and get away from it recharge and get ready for the next season Uh, i don't really see a whole lot of that now and i think there's a there's always a saying uh you know you don't have to get ready if you stay ready well yeah and some things that make sense but when you're playing a major league sport you have to give your body time to rest and your mind time to recharge and refresh itself and get ready for that long upcoming season. Because if you don't, uh, we're not going to see a whole lot of guys playing 15 plus years anymore. I think that that's already, you know, pretty much uh, gone by the wayside. There aren't many guys that are going to play that long now because I think they just burn themselves out over time. Yeah. This, this generation wants, it's all about the information they get. So, you know, you talk about now the information where it's just, every five set that you know they're getting some. So when you were coming up, what kind of information were you given as far as, you know, you know the advanced meetings, right. For, for the hitters and, and pitcher, what, what were your, what was the information like then compared to what it was like towards the end of your career? Well, for me, what I always, what I was uh, instructed to do by the veteran players that uh, took me under their wing when I first got to the big leagues, first got to big league camp, uh, Reggie Jackson, Rod Carew, George Hendrick, Bob Boone, uh, Doug DeSensei, Rupert Jones, just the list goes on. But talking with those guys, listening to those guys, pass on the information that made them major leaguers for an awfully long time. Um, it was really just don't miss the fastball. You want to hit the fastball. You're going to get at least one in every single at bat, no matter who's pitching. And if you don't, Maybe he leaves something up in the zone. You take advantage of that. But it was really to hit the fastball. So that was always my philosophy. When I get it, do something with it. Hit it, you know, where somebody's not standing, but definitely try and put it in play. You know, the the whole the old adage, hey, you know, you got to work on breaking balls. You have to work on, you know, hitting sliders. My philosophy was this. You have to learn how to recognize those pitches. Because if you get a good one, you're not going to hit it. You're not going to hit it well. That's why it's called a good pitch. It doesn't matter what kind of hitter you are or who you are as a hitter. If a pitcher throws whatever pitch where he wants to, when he wants to, as a hitter, there's nothing you can do. You're out. If you look at, you know, all the mistakes that I, or all the things that I talk about, you know, with the highlights and, you know, this guy hitting a home run, driving in three, driving in five, you go back to, to the actual hit and you see where it is. It's a mistake. It's a mistake, and that's what hitters take advantage of. So, my philosophy: hit that fastball. If you get when you once you get the two strikes, then you've got to do what you have to do. But if you're in position to hit the fastball, you're going to hit a hanging slider. You're going to hit a hanging changeup. You're going to hit a hanging curveball. So, be in position to hit the fastball, and you you have a chance to hit anything else. So, so your advanced meetings that was pretty much it. When you or would they even have advanced meetings at that point, or did that did not start till later on? Yeah, we did have advanced meetings, and usually the, our advanced scout was a former big leaguer, whether it was a pitcher or a hitter that played for an awfully long time. So my question, I only needed one question. Well, I, there may be two or three questions I have. My first question was always this: How hard is this fastball? I want to know what his top speed is. And from there, I can adjust. Okay, now does it move? Does it sink? Does it run? What, is, what does it do? And then the last thing was, okay, what's his out pitch? What is he going to use when he gets you two strikes? And for me, I needed to know that because most of the guys on, on, on the teams that I was on, those guys, you know, they drove the ball, hit the ball out of the ballpark. My game, I was taught to slap the ball the other way because I could run at one point. Even though I know it doesn't look like it now, I used to be able to get after it a little bit. <laughs> so 
I, I wanted to know what that was. Fastball, okay, I've got it. He's 98 to 100, okay. I can take that the other way. I can inside out it from both sides of the plate. No big deal, okay? He's got me at two strikes. You're going to use a changeup to get me out, a splitter, fork, what? What? What is that out pitch? And then go from there. So I didn't need a lot of information because, number one, there's only so much information uh, you can, you know, use when you're in that batter's box or even out on the field. You know, in the batter's box, you've got less than three quarters of a second to decide three things. And I think everybody gets two of those. You know what those are. One is either swing, don't swing. And the, the most important one of them all that most people don't get, even baseball players that I've asked this question of, the third one is what? Get out of the way. That's it. Because you don't know if the ball is coming at you or not. So it's a decision, you know, especially for you, a right-hander, you see a big breaking ball. Am I going to, you know, am I going to hang in there? Am I going to hang in there? Or am I going to get out of the way? Is it going to break enough? You know what I mean? So those are the three things that uh, a hitter needs to, uh, that he has to decide on in less than three quarters of a second. Yeah. You know what you're looking for, or you should have a game plan when you're going up there, to, you know, to get in that box. And then once you get in the box, you have to wipe everything. You can't be sitting there thinking, okay, spin rate is this, and in such and such account, there's no time for that. None. Yeah, and they didn't have video back then, did they? Or was that just starting to come in? You know, Hold having... it down. We had video back in the day. Man. <laughs> VHS, uh, yeah, we had, my we bad. Had video. <laughs> but you're right. It was just starting to become uh, you know, prevalent in the game. Uh, I was a big video guy. I still have my videos God, back as, as far back as believe it or not, 1983 Jeez. in a So uh, I was always a video guy, whether I was on the plane, I'd have something that I could play, play my, uh, my, what I called my dig me tapes, because all I wanted to see were hits. I didn't want to see myself getting out. I, I want to see what I was doing right, not what I was doing wrong. And then just try and imprint that in my brain and get that uh, all important muscle memory going. So uh, I was a very big video guy. Yeah, you're trying to, it's just that positive reinforcement of, right? Because we, yeah. that's, you know, it was guaranteed, you know, we were able to go back and look at a pitch or something just to, you know, the, to see now. But I think it's, and we, you knew your limitation, what you need. This is the info I need. I don't need any more. It seems that, that today's players need, they don't know when to stop with the information, right? Yeah. And, 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 and you see that, yeah. right? And that's the biggest thing. It, it's, it's almost as if it's too much. You know, we, we always live by that old, the old adage, you know, less is more type of thing. But I don't think this generation understands that part of it because of the way, like you said, from that time till now, it seems the same philosophies look for that fastball, right? Able to, that's all you're looking for. And then able to pick up, you know, the, uh, the break of, of the pitch to see it out of the hand, right. To see the rotation quickly. Cause granted you had those guys that threw those nasty break and you just couldn't, you know, the old ah, out of the way. And it was, you, yep. you tip your cap to them. But you knew then from that moment on that he had that pitch in there. So when you did see it, you weren't going to bail on it this time. Grant, okay, if it did come out of his hand, he missed up by. But at least you knew now not to give away because you see, you see a lot. I mean, you see a lot, especially now. You you know doing TV and stuff of watching games. Too many guys doing, you know, pulling out of the way just because of. And you can see it on camera. Wait, I saw that out of his hand, right? You can see as soon as you right. see the hand coming of what it was going to do. It's the guys that that would hide it that could get the ball to move three, four feet. You know, the Tim Hudson's that could do it, throw 93 to 98 when he was in Oakland and didn't have a chance really. You know, umpires didn't help. I'm sorry. Who's ever listening out there? John Hirschbeck, love you, buddy. But, yeah, those. But that's some of the stuff you couldn't you couldn't understand, right, because it was – that's the hard part. And, and, uh, and as players, we just had to learn to make that adjustment to see it. So, um, you know, you talk about you as – what your job was as – a as a as a middle infielder type of thing. As, you were the you were a table setter, right? You were you were that guy. You were getting on base for the big boys behind you. Um, another aspect, it seemed like it's just gone by the wayside. I mean, how how important was that for you, for your team, for your who? So who was your manager your first few years playing? Oh wow, uh, Gene Mock with the Angels was my first manager in the big leagues, and yes, my job was to be that table setter to get on base to move runners over. And as a matter of fact, when I was at my rookie year, uh, I set a Rangers uh, record uh, for sacrifice bunts in a game, in a season. And I had to bunt. It didn't matter what inning it was either. If it was the first inning, we hit, you know, we scored four runs or whatever. I'm hitting, you know, seventh, eighth, or ninth. 
If there are runners on first and second, nobody out, a runner on first, nobody out. I didn't have a sign. I knew I was bunting. I, I would look at third, but I knew I was bunting. That that was what he told me. These are the situations. I want you button that ball, getting that runner over. That was it. There wasn't any, hey, you know, trying to hit the ball in the gap, get a base hit. No, I'm setting the table, get that guy on the third or get him in second in the scoring position, let the guy behind me drive him in. So uh, it, it was just, uh, it was a different time. No question about it. And that's that's the thing. You won't. You probably won't ever see that record broken as far as the sacrifice buns. But, you know, that, and that's the thing I don't think this this generation notices as well. So you're going into the bottom of the ninth knowing, okay, you're leading off down by two, three runs, and you know who's behind you. So you're already in that thought process of what do I need to do? I need to figure out how to get get on for these guys. And I'm sure the, even the veteran guys have come up to you, hey, Mac, let's go. We need you to get on here, right? I'm sure that conversation is it's, it's always had, right? People think that nobody really says anything to anybody, but you know, right? Coming even in that eighth inning, oh, bottom cool. of the eighth, right? Or to, top of the ninth inning, you're out there thinking, all right, we need to get these runs, you know, save these runs here. I'm leading off. We got to get the big boys up. Yeah, that just seems to go, it's gone by the wayside now. You know, your, your thought isn't, I'm going up here yeah. trying to hit a three run home with nobody on base. Right. And it's, and that's just, that's the mentality you had, right? You had that and the guys were, and that's yeah. what was expected of you. And you just don't see that, right? No, you, you don't see it. And for me, I was actually looking, you know, from about the fifth to sixth inning on, okay, running the different scenarios through my head as I'm going along through the game. Okay, if I come up in the eighth or ninth inning, I've got to get on if we're down or if we're, if we're ahead. I still have to get on. My job never really changed. Get on base. It would change a little bit if we're, you know, if I'm leading off and we're down, you know, two or three, then I'm probably going to try to make that pitcher work, whether it's the closer or, you know, anybody, some whoever it was. I want to make that pitcher throw as many pitches as possible. One, maybe he'll walk me. Or two, um, I want to wait for something that I can get to, drive, to get on base so the guys behind me can do some damage. So I, I really try to think like a manager, uh, and that probably started my time uh, in Baltimore, my first time when I was up with Johnny Oates. Uh, being able to play with Cal Ripken uh, actually taught me a lot. Taught me a lot about the game. I thought I knew the game uh, pretty well then, but being able to play with him and watch how he went about it and the things that he knew uh, in a game or what was going on in the game, uh, it really upped my game. It really did. I really became a student of the game. I always wanted to learn. I always wanted to know as much as I could about the game. But there were things that Cal did that um, I didn't know people did or players did for that matter. So, he, he, for instance, we'd be in spring training and we're doing cutoffs and relays, the thing that everybody hates doing, and we were not doing them well. Johnny Oates was the manager. Johnny Oates was not the one to call timeout. Cal called timeout and brought everybody in. Hey, everybody to the mound. Everybody, every group, pitchers, everybody to the mound. And he said, okay, if there's a ball here in the right field gap with a runner on first base, you're supposed to be over there. You're supposed to be over here. You're supposed to be over there. You're supposed to be there, here, there, everywhere. Johnny, you better be right there at the top step watching all this go on. So, you know, for me, I'm like, okay, I've always known where I was supposed to be. I've always known where my shortstop and first baseman and, and, and third baseman, I know where they're going to line up. But he's running off where everybody's supposed to be. Everybody's covered. Okay, that ball in the right center field gap is the left fielder going to come over there and back up third base, try and keep, you know, if we don't have a play at home, we got to look for, look for third. You know, those kind of things, the, the, the little things that win ball games, being able to pick up a sign uh, and relay it to one of your players uh, without beating on a trash can. Uh, <laughs> those <laughs> things were, were the things that, we, that we'd look for. Uh, or that I started looking for. And I was like, man, this guy really knows everything about the game. So from that point on, uh, my career, my game, uh, it went up a notch. Actually, it probably went up a couple of notches. So uh, I've got to give him a, a lot of credit. I will never, ever tell him that to his face. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure next time I see Cal. <laughs> and tell him about so, you see, Tell him I said this. <laughs> <laughs> and Cal's a very personable guy when you know you just talk to him. But to think about it, you, you know, you play in second base. Cal's playing shortstop, premium premium positions where 
you've got a lot of information in the process, right? You're trying to look to see pitches to know, you know, where, like you talk about cuts and relays. And then on top of you talk about you and planning your at bats three innings later, right? You know, I'm in the outfield. I'm just checking the grass and seeing what's going on while you guys are doing stuff. And we have a little bit different time. So you think about the information you're processing and you thought, and we're always evolving, right? We'll never know everything, but that's as players, that's what we do. Right. But, and then you said Cal's out there doing this information. You're going, wow, I've got more that I can continue to learn. It, and and you learn just by listening to to a guy that played that played short. Like I said, it's a lot of stuff for him to process. But to know where the other eight guys need to be, I mean, you, you don't you can't teach that type of stuff. And and I think that's another thing too now that we're not seeing because guys aren't students of the game. They're not sitting on that top step, you know, standing next to Cal or standing next to, you know, standing next to Alex or Pudge and the Dutch, just sitting there listening to them, right, to watch the game. You know, they're on their, their iPads checking this stuff out. And and it, that's what's what's missing from the game is these guys, they're not really into the game. It's almost as if you have a book and a movie, but the same concept, but you get more from the book because you're actually in, in great, pulled into it where the movie is just going by. And I think that's what's missing, right, is – as like you said, as a middle infielder, you're seeing this processing all this information on top of my next couple of bats, you know, where we need to be. So, I mean, and that's what I mean. But like you said, to be able to learn that and take that from him and it just what it does to your to, to your game, because then what happens when you go to another team, right? You're sharing that information, correct? Correct. Absolutely. And, and you know, the thing for me, I think the game comes from upstairs. You have the analytics department that gives the guys the information and gives them how to play the game. I very rarely see a player now make an adjustment on their own in the game during a pit, during that bat, pitch to pitch, a pitcher make an adjustment because hey, hey, this guy's feeling good today. Maybe my fastball is not what it's supposed to be. My my stuff, I, I don't have my A game. I have to make an adjustment in game. I don't see much of that going on. I think they just stick to what they get, you know, as far as the reports that they go over in their meetings every single day. Uh, to me, it's just way, way too much because the game isn't played. <clears throat> excuse me. The game is not played on a piece of paper. It's played on the field. So when you get that, all that information, what that information is supposed to be is the closest representation of that particular player that it's about as possible. It doesn't mean that it's written in stone that this is what he's going to do. This is how he's going to, going to do it in a certain situation because take a picture, for example. We know what their patterns are. But guess what else? So do they. So every now and then, they're going to change that up. They know what the book is on them. Hey, you know, your guys ahead, one and two, he likes to throw that cutter. He's going to come in on you. Well, he may not do that. He may do something else. His elbow may be sore, or he may not have been able to get it over for a strike all night long. You have to make an adjustment. So I think the game comes down uh, from the analytic department, and it doesn't leave a whole lot of room for in-game adjustments. That, it, it's interesting you talk about that where um, a guy's feeling, like you said, his elbow or something sore. And, you know, catchers come in. You've, you've had that – we've had that discussion where guys come from the you – know, the starting catcher's coming in, right, and the pitcher finishes warming up, and he's coming in. And he looks at you, and he's like, ah, curveball's not working tonight, right? So your your thought is, mm -hmm. as, as a team, as a player is, all right, what is he going to do? You know, the catch, so the catchers pick up on that, right, and they understand it. The same, like you said, same thing with hitters. You know, maybe you got jammed or something, and it's a cold, and now your your hand's sore, so I've got to change, you know, what I'm looking for as far as trying to, to hit, but and these adjustments that, that aren't made, but that's the one thing that analytics don't take into consideration. You know, you have, I guess they have cards now, right? Somebody's red on certain days and then somebody's, somebody's green. Well, what if the guy that's red is feeling great? Well, well the no, analytics say you can't. So, well, you can't, you can't pitch today. Well, you know, what do you got? You, we've got guys that are bulldogs that want to go out there I, and they'll say, I don't care what the hell that thing says. I'm ready to go. So as a manager, then what, what are they supposed to do? Right. It's, I guess gone are those days, right? Because managers will walk through. They'll walk through the clubhouse. Mac, how you feeling today? Ah, knees a little bit sore. All right, hey, we'll just get, why don't you just take it easy today? We'll, you know, if we need you, mm -hmm. perfect, right? I mean, is, is yeah. now is it basically, like you said, is that there's a lineup coming from up top? Hey, hey, here's who's playing today. This and that. Well, what if they're not feeling? I, the numbers say they got to play today. But 
is I mean, yeah. so as as watching it on TV and being a commentator and and calling these games, I mean, are you seeing that, or is that a feeling you get? Or are you having discussions? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I do think it comes from upstairs, you know, from a lot of teams. Uh, and to me, I think that manager is the one who really needs to make that decision. That's what a manager's job is to know your personnel and you're managing your personnel, know what your, your personnel's weaknesses are, know what their strengths are, know how they are each and every day. When they, when they walk into that clubhouse door as a manager, I think you've got to get a read on all of that every single day about every one of your players. And to me, that's why number, that's why communication is the biggest asset a manager needs. He has to be able to communicate with those players because he needs to get to know who they are, what situations they thrive in, what situations they want to stay away from. Same thing for, for those guys out in the bullpen. What situations do they kind of, you know, get tight in? Knowing all of those things, um, you want to put a player in the best position to succeed as much as you possibly can. So uh, being able to manage those guys, that's what, that's what managing is to me. The game is going to tell you what, what needs to be done at any particular time. But that manager's game, uh, that starts when he hits that clubhouse door, which is usually the first one of the first ones that first ones there, one o'clock, two o'clock, and then guys start filtering in. And throughout the course of the day, if I'm managing, I may walk through once or twice just to just to get a feel. I want to feel what's going on in the clubhouse. That doesn't mean I need to sit there and and listen to conversations and you know, I I, I don't even have to say anything. I can just walk through the clubhouse, going from the office. Down through the, down to the to the uh, dugout. Oh, I can get a sense fairly quickly on how that clubhouse is, how most of the guys are, and then during batting practice, I'm walking around, looking guys in the eyes, and you know, saying you know whatever, just talking to them, getting that feel for what my personnel can do. Can I use this guy today? He's you know a little tired, a little sore, a little stiff, can't do something that I may need in that seventh, eighth, or ninth inning. I'm not going to go to him. I'm going to go to somebody else. So there, there's so many things that a manager needs. But man, that that number one thing, in my opinion, is communication and knowing that uh, knowing this personnel. Yeah, because you think of it as almost as a parent, right? They're your, that's your kid. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not using the term kids, but you like you said, you feel the atmosphere of what's in the clubhouse, right? It could have been a bad game the night before, and you want to walk through. And you want to see how guys respond, right? What are they? What are they doing? Are they just everybody's, everybody just moping? It, this and that in the corner or are you know are the guys playing cards are they you know are they playing ping pong are they are they doing this and that and then, you know you walk through and, and i think the, the guys the managers that notice that are one guys that played at that level right the highest level because they know what yeah. goes through day in day out but it also shows your team that the manager actually cares enough to come just to come through there right like you said you don't have to say anything you know because guys thought hey skip just walk through oh you know, yep. He's just checking on us to see, you know, just to see. Right. And then, and then, you know, right. You, you get a feel for, for how that granted that doesn't always work that way. It could be a crappy game and you guys mm-hmm. felt good, but Hey, there's nothing you can do. But so as, but, but you're right as a manager though, that is, that's one of the biggest things is of understanding your guys, what they need to do. Um, and I was, that was the best part of knowing, you know, if you had a game that, the night before the manager goes, Hey, we're going to give you the day off tomorrow. Right. Perfect. That was able to, mm-hmm. to go through your workout. I mean, and that's why you're something about now is, are they coming down with the lineup saying, all right, I, you know, Hey Mac, we're going to give you off tomorrow. Okay. Oh, perfect. And then they come down today. Hey Mac, supposed to be going to play today. Go, no, I just told him that. So are, are these managers, do you think as a, are they more of a, gosh, of a puppet? I know it's hard for you to, to, you know, from, from calling, but do, do you see that? Is it a feeling that you get? I mean, I know just from watching, you see the teams that have success mm-hmm. are the guys that have played, at that highest level. Grant, there are some anomalies, but for the most part, they're mm-hmm. guys that, that know what it takes. I mean, so so seeing that, I mean, what are your thoughts on that process? Yeah, I think for the most part, guys that have played and, and know what it's like to be a player out in a game uh, at, at the highest level there is, uh, that definitely helps. Uh, and yes, I know teams that do send down a uh, lineup and, you know, the manager may not want to play a guy, a certain guy at a certain on a certain day. But that analytics department says, no, this guy's supposed to be in because it's X, Y, and Z. There's not a, there's not a lot of um, leeway uh, as far as that goes uh, from, from a lot of the teams that I've seen and, and from uh, coaches and even managers that I've talked to uh, that get that, uh, get that lineup card from upstairs every day. 
Um, it, it's man, it's really, really difficult to manage under those circumstances. And I'm not saying that every organization does that, uh, but I know for a fact that a lot of a lot of them do. I still have guys that uh, that I know that are coaching and and, and even managing. That, uh, you know, we talk about it every time we get together, just like just like we do when we see each other uh, in the grocery store. <laughs> we have a, a, quick, a quick rundown, a quick assessment of the game today every time. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, it's it, it's it's definitely different in that regard. So I, I just like the I like the manager, you know, being able to manage, manage his personnel. He is in there every single day. And, you know, that's another thing that's that's uh, quite different from when I first came up. The only way you knew the general manager was at the game. Home games, you know he's there. But on the road, the only way you knew that the general manager was there was uh, you look over the dugout, you're coming off the field, and there the GM is sitting there watching the game. You had no idea he was coming uh, because you didn't see the general manager that often. Yeah. So- and now I think guys see them every single day. Yeah, on top of the amount of coaches that run through. Right. I mean, I, a buddy of mine just got the bench coach job in Frisco, double A. I, my first thought was they have a bench coach in double A. We had a manager, a hitting coach and a pitching coach. And that was it. And one of the guys would go oh, coach first base, right. If they weren't playing, I mean, it's, yeah, well, it, that's what I mean. It seems well, like we it's have, oversaturation. Yeah, we, we, yeah. There are too many, to, to me, there are too many cooks in the kitchen. Yep. Having a, a hitting instructor an assistant hitting instructor and assistant to the assistant hitting instructor. That's a lot. And as a, as a player, you don't want too much in your head. So what that hitting instructor really is, he's a psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. That's what he is. He's got some drills, some tools that he takes out of the tool bag to help each and every player because every player is a different type of a hitter. And you have to figure that out, who that is. But if you're getting voices or you're hearing voices from two or three different places, that makes this game that's already tough. Uh, it makes it that much tougher. So you've not only got the hitting coach's, uh, you know, opinion, you've got the assistant hitting coach's opinion, and you've got your own opinion because you're the player that has to get out there and execute that, whatever that may be. So you've got a lot of voices you've got to really try and and feed out because you can't do all three. You can't listen to all three philosophies, especially if they're different. Uh, So, yeah, there are just way too many, in my opinion, coaches out there. And by the way, when I was in the minor leagues, we had a manager and a pitching coach. We didn't have a hitting hitting coach. The hitting coach was the manager, and hopefully, the manager wasn't a pitcher. <laughs> so, because that's it. He had he had no help for you, so you had to rely on yourself and uh, your position players to really get you uh, get you through some things in the minor leagues. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, you know, we talk about Rudy all the time, right? You've you've worked with Rudy forever. <laughs> Can you imagine him with? With, you know, three, four hitting coaches in in there. Rudy would have, like you said, he probably would have beaten them all up and then probably would have beaten us up for even listening to him or having him in there. I mean, we had Frazier in there um, as a, you know, as a, he and Spanky would be out there for throwing BP and stuff, but everybody else would be, you know, they bring guys in. We'd have our double and triple A guys in spring training. And then, you know, once roster yeah. expanded, they would come up and help. But they knew it was the same philosophy. And I think that's probably lost in go. that as well, right? Because they're all under the same philosophy that Rudy had. But, you know, these no guys question. go somewhere else in the wintertime and they're working with a different philosophy and then all of a sudden they show up at spring training and, wait, what are we doing here? So you're trying, you're having to restart, yeah. you know, yeah, I have, a, these, this guy has a degree in biomechanics, but that's still, you, you still don't know what it feels like to be standing in Yankee Stadium with 60,000 no. people telling you to go pound sand, right? Facing, facing Mariano Rivera. Right. Exactly. Then And the numbers can't do that. The analytics can't give you the feel part of it. So it's, and these guys can, right? And that's the the beauty of it, watching guys, of understanding. You talk about what guys are doing, what they're going to do in different situ- situations. But, you know, like you said, there's too many people in your ear. Well, he did this to me. Well, he didn't. Oh, gosh, hold on. Time out here. You know, it's it becomes – and no wonder yeah. these guys seem more robotic than they do with just letting the game happen. I mean, even play, even, you know, defensively, do you see guys that are more – robotic than they are just letting the game flow. I mean, you're a middle infielder watching this. I mean, no, they've changed the rules, well, you know, get your your feelings on that the double play rule here too. But I mean, do you see that as a, as, as, a, as a middle infielder, the defense, just not letting the game flow and just trying to force everything. Yeah, I, I do see it that way. And, you know, having Rudy as a hitting instructor, my five years with Texas, I had him here, but I also had Rudy in 91 when I was with Houston. 
And what Rudy, what Rudy's philosophy was then, it's always the same. Get that foot down, be ready, and if you get it, don't miss it. That's basically his philosophy. Have, if you've got that foot down, you're ready to hit anything. Now, in 91, I didn't really grasp all of that, all that well the first time around with Rudy. But the second time when I got to Texas, I was like, Rudy, you know, I know exactly what you're talking about now. I said, because you're saying the same thing to me now that she said to me five years ago. So I have it now. And if there were other, any hitting, uh, hitting instructions or anybody else giving any of Rudy's hitters uh, any kind of advice about hitting, you better believe their body would disappear. <laughs> their body would disappear never to be found again because you want to have one philosophy that same philosophy that continuity all the way through you don't want to be working with you know your hitting instructor one day and the next day you've got your assistant hitting instructor and i know he may have said that yes uh i'm gonna, I'm, I'm teaching his philosophy but he's human at some point there's going to be a difference in what message you're getting because the hit, the assistant hitting instructor may see something or think he sees something that the hitting instructor doesn't see, and he's going to put his two cents in there, and it's probably going to be be different. So at some point, that happens to every to everyone. There's no question about it. Even though they'll say, no, no, I, I go with we have the same philosophy. There are very few people that have the same hitting philosophy. You and I, we have we have I know that we have a lot in common, and our philosophies are are are, are Almost lockstep, I'm sure. But there are some differences. And there's always going to be that. You have to leave room for that. But you cannot have two, three, four different people telling you how to do things. It, it just doesn't work out very well. You're not going to be in the big leagues very long if you're doing that. Because at some point, you're going to be confused. Uh, but as far as letting the game flow, the game flows as much as that, the, those cards. Let it flow. That's what it boils down to you look at a card okay i've got to go i've got to play over here well last time he was up he got a hanging breaking ball and he pulled it down the line so maybe i shouldn't go over there as far as they say i should so that's an in-game adjustment that i don't really see a whole lot of guys making it just stays everything stays the same you're just going to go by this and stay up stay on this and not change it and it, it just to me that just makes the game a lot harder. The uh, so you were you know playing you played second you played third right you played short you played everywhere but did you you never caught did you or pitched no no but everywhere else or first or first okay. uh, I didn't play first you did yeah. so thought, those three okay. no I never played first uh, fortunately I was always on a team that you know we had multiple guys that could play first before my name would even come come into you know into the into the question so. Um, that was good as far as pitching and catching goes. I know a lot of guys have done the, you know, hey, play one inning in every position. Um, That's a daily I never occurrence nowadays, by the way. That happens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, uh, yeah, playing multiple positions, yes, but trying to do the one, you know, play all nine positions in one game. I never wanted to do that because for me, I took, you know, playing a lot of different positions extremely serious. And I felt if I got, you know, put the catching gear on for one inning, that I was disrespecting that catcher that puts that gear on every single day. And that's how he got himself to the big league. So for me to do it for one inning, uh, you know, just as a novelty, to me, that was very disrespectful to a Pudge and Dan Wilson or Bob Boone. So I was not going to do that. And if a, and if a manager came to me and said, Hey, do you want to catch? I'd tell him no anyway. <laughs> yeah. That's a tough place to be. I'm not, I'm not catching. And pitching the same thing, even if it's a blowout. Oh, well, you know, the team needs you. No, they don't need me to pitch. I don't care if it's 20 to nothing and we have no more arms left. We're just going to walk off the field because I'm not going to get on that pitching now. That is, I mean, to me, that's another sign of disrespect showing, hey, you know, guys that do this every day for a living, they're at the top of their game. And then I come in and, you know, I'm, you know, throwing things up there. I just don't really believe in, in you know, saving my pitchers. You're going to go out there, we're going to get 27 ounces, we're getting out of here. We need to win. We'd love to win. If not, we're going to go home. So I just never looked at that as something that I, you know, was that I wanted to do or even be a part of. Yeah, that's a daily occurrence now where position players are pitching. You know, Fry Daddy's out there yeah. letting them know on all that stuff. The uh, Yes, he is. Yes, yes, he is. For sure. So <laughs> so playing playing second base and then moving to third, what, you know, the, the mentality of what it is, because third base is completely different mentality, right? I mean, you've got – 
gargantuan men hitting a baseball it looks like an aspirin and you're playing in you what what changes with your thought process of playing from middle infield to, to to third base especially nowadays where guys are just trying to yank everything i hated it <laughs> i hated it the very first time i played first base or third base uh, i was playing for johnny with the orioles and like you said it was the mentality that you really had to that I had to uh, get to. I had to get to that place mentally where it doesn't matter where I play, which I developed, you know, over the next year or so. But I I really hated it. The very first ball that was hit to me was a hard one hopper to my left. I reach out, ball hits my, hits the women in my glove, and I'm getting ready to pull my hand back in to make make the play over at first base. Then I pull my hand in and there's nothing there but my hand. (laughs) The ball took my glove off my hand (laughs) <laughs> onto the grass and short left field. Do you know how hot I was for that? I didn't I didn't I, I didn't have a third base glove. So I was still using my second base glove, which kind of hangs off my hand a little bit. Yeah. And so that little glove caught it, pulled that thing right off. And I, I already didn't want to be over there. And now that happens my very first play. Yeah, so I really had to make an adjustment mentally and say, hey, it doesn't matter where you play. Um, I got some help with that. One of them, uh, Tony Phillips, who was one of the original guys that started playing multiple positions, third base, second base, uh, left field. Uh, he gave me some advice. We had the same manager or the same uh, same agent. And he said, no, nah, you need to get out there and get to the plate four or five times a night. If you have to play third base to do it, then that's what you do. And you, you can pick it at second, you can pick it at short, you can pick it at third, you can pick it wherever you go. And so once I got that through my thick head, that's when I, I became more comfortable at third base and was able to do it. Didn't matter if I, you know, I see myself, okay, there's third base, go get them. Just get to the plate four or five times a night and you're playing. And that was really the main goal. Didn't matter where I played. I just to play. I needed to play. Yeah. So explain, explain to people a little bit about the glove. The middle infield gloves are basically the size of your hand, correct? Which is probably yes. about 11 and a quarter, maybe 11 and a half the most. Third base gloves are what, about a 12 type on size wise? So least, tell them you're basically least, playing. 12. Okay. So you're playing 30 feet in with an infield glove. Basically, your bare handed dudes are hitting rockets. So just you know, trying to explain them what a little bit bigger third base glove because the webbing you've got to react quicker and you need a little bit more. So I didn't know you you had it hanging off your hand. I know in the outfield we did. We put two in the bottom, and we would have you know the glove as much as we could. But I'd be afraid of catching one off right off. Basically, we call it look like the hosel of your wrist, right where your wrist would have been taking a grounder mm-hmm. there. Um, yeah. Right, because well, middle and field is more about feel than it correct than it is at third. Yeah, but you know when you're you know, the reason that's well, that's really the reason you were an outfielder, not an infielder, because you were taking it off. <laughs> they, exactly. The harder they hit it, the farther back I wanted to go. <laughs> as, a, as an infielder, you want your hand to be as smooth as possible and flexible, and be able to take the bad hops and, and just uh, be quick with it. And the way you have, the, the only way you could do that, if you have the glove actually all the way on your hand, your hand's not going to move or your wrist isn't going to be as flexible as it is if it's hanging off of your hand, Yeah, you know, with the gloves hanging off your hand. So that's how I was taught to do it. That's how I saw Ozzy Smith, Gary Templeton, Davey Lopes. Those were my idols growing up. That's how I saw them doing it. And so, hey, lo and behold, that's exactly what I did. And that's how most big league infielders uh, wear their glove, halfway hanging off, especially uh, the second baseman and having that small glove. So you're able to get the ball in and out to turn that double play quickly. Uh, that's really the reason for the small glove at second base. And, you know, you're further away from home plate than you are at third base. So, yes, you'll still have rockets hit at you at second and short, but nothing like the hot corner. And that's why they call it the hot corner, because it's getting there quickly, especially with uh, everybody now. That's all they're trying to do is launch everything. So having that small glove at second base was fine. Definitely needed a net over there, third base. And so I, I had three gloves uh, when I played, one for the middle infield, uh, actually one for second base, one for short and third, and then an outfield glove that I brought to the, I brought those to the dugouts every yeah. single game. So having the reason you have different size gloves for different positions. Yep, exactly. Those were, I like my big old 12 and a half, 13 inch outfield gloves, able to, 
to just run and, and grab glove. it. Yes, absolutely. That's yeah. why people always ask, can I get a yeah. glove? I need one for softball and this and that. So it's, that was, yeah. those are the fun parts. So it, you talk about the, the, the hops that you take on the infield. I, I said this, the harder they hit it, the farther back I wanted to go. We played in Dirk's thing a couple of years ago. I was playing short and I think Mike was at second. And the infield is, you know, get a little hard. And that ball took a hot, hit me in the thumb, boy. Uh-uh. Never again will I be on the infield. So playing mm-hmm. in all those years, is there any one hop that really just that stood out and took a just a wicked? I mean, we all see the Ozzy Smith play, right? At short, when he's in San Diego, yeah. the barehanded play. Was there any of those that just you know the, where guys you knew when you talk about playing on playing in the turf? That ball, you definitely don't want ball turf, but something that just sticks out in your mind playing that really just never again will I ever get in front of one of those or play on this field. You ever have one of those moments? I had a couple of those. I'm sure I had quite a few, but the two there are two that really stand out. One was my rookie year, and the other one was my last year. So my rookie year, uh, I'm playing second base. We're in Oakland. Dave Parker's hitting. So back then there wasn't okay. Let's you know go back 15 feet on the grass because this guy's a dead pool hitter. It's going to come my way. Be ready. There wasn't that. So I was on the infield. Uh, I was at the edge of the grass, over in a hole a little bit, and of course. Uh, Parkway crushed one, and it was one of those, you know, hooking line drives. Oh, a little top spin? And I'm, I, yeah, a lot oh. of top spin. I play it off to the side, and like you were talking about the ball hitting you right there. Yep. That ball hit me right, I mean, nowhere nowhere close to my glove. I'm there, I'm, I think I'm getting ready to pick it, and it hit me in my forearm, oh. and I lost feeling. <laughs> the whole arm, it just felt like got amputated. And of course, that's what they gave. They, I think they, I don't know what they gave it because I was really worried about my arm. But it, he ended up, Parker ended up on first base. And I'm just standing there. He knows that I'm in pain. And I'm trying not to, you know, let everybody know how much that really hurt. Uh, and then Dave Parker told me, he looked at me and said, Mac, if you want to survive in, that game, in this game, you don't want to get in front of one of mine. <laughs> and he just started cracking up. And I knew. I absolutely knew to not ever do that again. <laughs> so my fast forward 19 years to my last, uh, my last year, I was playing third base. I was with Oakland and I don't even remember what hitter this was. It was a right hand hitter. And in Oakland, you got the Oakland dugout right there on the third base side. A guy hit another hooking line drive. It takes a hop and I acted like I was getting off of a horse and that ball just kept following me. I just lifted my leg up and did a spin around and didn't touch the ball, but more importantly, the ball didn't touch me. And when I came, you know, when my next foot landed, I was kind of facing our dugout and they were all on the floor, just on the floor of the dugout, just cracking up. And I said, exactly. And I just started laughing too. I said, Hey, I'm, I'm not, uh, Listen, I'm 39 years old. Uh, me catching that ball, those days, those days are gone. It's it's all about self-preservation at that point. So <laughs> those are those are two. I know I had many more that I shouldn't have gotten in front of, but I did. Uh, but those two really stand out. Oh my goodness! And you're right. Those because some of those infields can be hard as a rock, and it's skit that the grass is thin. You know, even a little bit of dew on those things, man. There's you know those balls just. <sighs> You never wish for that, especially hitting you in a in a bad spot. You know, you, you see stuff and watch no. guys now. I mean, taking them off. I remember a ball. We were in New York playing Yankees. They hit a ball at, at Tino. He was playing even with the bag, and I, it was one of those that just sits along the grass. It was a it was a, a rock sitting along the grass, and he went to field it, and all of a sudden it just shot and went straight mm-hmm. over his head. Wow! <laughs> and he, he puts his head down and looking, and I, I run by. He goes, "I said, what are you thinking?" He goes. I just didn't want it to hit me in the face, right? Because it's you think right. it's it's a nice clean, it's grass. It shouldn't take a hop like that, and it unless there's a sprinkler head there and it shot over. But man, you're right. These the, the way these fields are set up now, um, and guys and guys doing that and taking just just right, especially the guy, how hard they're hitting the ball. But you don't see a lot of it now. But they're trying to hit it in the air. So uh, no, you you really don't. I tell you what, that's why it's so amazing uh, to have watched Adrian Beltre play at third base and the way that he played third base all of these years with no cup. <laughs> that was, I mean. Yeah. I don't think any I guy really, ever wore a cup unless he was catching. 
Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I had a cup of everywhere I played. No, I'm now, just when, talking about the Latin guys, the outfield, That's when I would, that's when I wouldn't wear one. But man, I, w- I would want a shield <laughs> if I was playing third base. Because <laughs> that, some of those times you get over there at third base, man, just, I just put that shield up and, hey, try and, try and, you know, ricochet it over to first base if I need to. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. You're right. He was, Adrian was like a vacuum cleaner, and you're and you're not going to see them. I mean, you've got guys, you know, Nolan mm-hmm. Arenado these days is is pro- is is the best one out there, to, you know, that's able to with the arm strength and everything else. But right, that it's that mentality, you know, it's almost like a hockey goal. I don't yeah. care. I'm going to stand in here, especially with guys being able to slash and everything else. Right, even third base mm-hmm. coaches, if they're playing, you know, uh, we got a guy on second. They're usually a little bit down the line. I don't know how one of them hasn't just been drilled. I've hit a third base coach before, but luckily it was in the belt of seeing that standing that close. Um, so, you know, you talk, so we talk about coaching. Would you, have you ever thought about getting into coaching again? Or is it just one of those where, you know, seeing stuff, you know, when you finish playing, was it, was that even a thought of getting into it? Cause people always ask, do you want to games change? I don't, I don't want to do it. I mean, you said they don't listen kids. They don't want to listen. They like said, there's so many people in their ear. There's this and that. I don't know. I mean, would, would you want to get back into coaching at all? No. Uh, when I retired, that was one of the reasons I retired. Well, probably the biggest reason I retired, I was 40. That was a big one. Uh, but it was time for me to be at home with my wife and kids. Uh, I had opportunities to coach my first three years out out of the game. But like you just said, you said everything that went through my mind. The game has changed. The guys don't want to listen. They don't want to learn. They think they know it all. By the time they get to the big leagues, you can't tell them anything. And... Yes, I, I have an old school mentality. If some, if I have a veteran player or a manager that's got some skins on the wall, tells me, "Hey, it says this or that, or the other," I'm going to take that in. I'm going to receive it, use what I can, and and keep it moving. But at that time, uh, the A's had a lot of younger players that were coming up, uh, and I was really kind of in a, in a mentoring situation, and that didn't go very well because none of them wanted to listen to anything. So I kind of the last couple of months just said, "Hey, okay, I." I won't say a word. If they come to me, great. If not, hey, it's their career. So, um, yes, I had that opportunity, but I just did not want to do it. I, but I think the biggest thing for me uh, on why I, I, I turned down those jobs was I just really felt I needed – I had had enough time. I left the game on my own terms, which was something that was that was huge for me. Um, it was what I wanted to do because if I had listened to everybody else as I was coming up, I never would have got past double A. So to play 19 years <clears throat> at the big league level and retire uh, a day before my 40th birthday, it, it was great. It was, I don't think it could have been written any better. Well, yeah, it could have. I could have got a ring that last year, but I didn't. So uh, <laughs> it was definitely time to go. So that first year <clears throat> that I retired, 05 was that first season. Uh, I started working for ESPN. But Joe Madden, who um, was the manager with Tampa at the time, uh, called me and asked me if I'd be his first base coach. And my answer to him was, hey, Joe, I, man, I, I, I just really need some time away from the game. I'm going to, you know, stay, just be with my family. That's what I really want to do. Uh, Joe was my first manager in rookie ball. So I've known Joe since I was 17 years old. So, <clears throat> I, you know, he said, Mac, I understand, no problem. You know, hey, Seth, uh, we'll stay in touch. And we did throughout the course of the season. Spring training rolls around, or now uh, the offseason comes up the next year. He asked me to be a third base coach. And I was like, man, that's pretty good. But Joe, man, I'm, I'm enjoying being at home. The next year rolls around. Uh, year number three he says, Mac, I really could use you as my bench coach. And I was like, man, that's a pretty good spot to start your coaching career. But I just wanted to be at home. I was, you know, going into my third year of broadcasting. That was my second year, <clears throat> excuse me, doing the Rangers pre and post. And I was really loving that because I was able to be at home. Uh, whether the team is on the road, go to the studio and do the show, they're at home, I'm at the ballpark. So that worked out much better for me as what I really wanted to do. Um, but coaching, if I'd gotten into coaching, I would have gotten, I wouldn't have gotten into coaching. I would have gotten into managing. because That was the only thing that I would have been satisfied with is managing stuff, not being a, a coach, a bench coach, first base coach, third base coach or any other kind of coach except manager. So that would have been uh, my goal if I had gone, if I had gone that route. You talk about, you, like you said, you had that, that first year. That's how I felt. You just want to take a step back. But once you were done playing, yeah. right, you got away from it. It was one of those where 
I don't want to get back into it, right? It's some guys, you know, we talk about hang on to hang on because they're chasing something. No, it's just one of those where it's, it just, it feels better. I had this discussion with Jackie Moore, same thing. He goes, gosh, this feels great. He was in baseball for 56 years. And his first thought was, man, this is awesome, <laughs> right? I don't have to deal with this, <laughs> this stress of everything, right, to do it. And then we've interviewed yeah. other guys that we've played yeah. with, they've coached, and just they tried it for a little bit, and it, like we said, these guys just they don't listen. They don't want to. They don't want to. They don't want to be a part of it, right? You're better off here watching, yeah. seeing you know, seeing what these guys do and and how they do it. So I mean, it's you know, it's it was that's the fun part of it. But granted, you know, you you see guys that we've played with that are managing. Um, you know, to, to see guys that some guys that have never managed. I mean, look at the Rosa. D Rose is going to be managing the world, the team USA in the world baseball classic with no managerial experience. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, it'll yeah. be interesting to see how, you know, how that works out, how he, you know, how he handles, you know, that situation. You know, some guys are just bred for it, right? They have that mentality. Mm-hmm. Some guys are trying to fight, you know, climb that mountain to, to get to it. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see how that, you know, how it works out. But, um, mm-hmm. So now, so nowadays, are you what? Are, what are you doing these days now, Mark? Are you still doing TV? What are you doing? That's it. Pre and post for the Rangers. Uh, occasionally, I'll do some work for MLB. dot com. Uh, it hasn't been so. I hasn't been much of that over the last few years, obviously with COVID. But really, I just concentrate on doing the Rangers pre and post game show, which I, I, I love doing because I still love the game, even though it's changed. Uh, and actually, my philosophy on it all has has, <clears throat> has been evolving. At heart, I'll still be that old school guy. And, you know, look at a lot of things through a, a different lens. And I think I still see things that, uh, you know, most players don't see and recognize throughout the course of the game that, uh, that can really change the outcome of it. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's what I, I love doing when I, when I stop loving doing it, that's when I'll stop. Um, uh, I won't be that guy that just, you know, just does it just to do it. If I don't, if I, if I stop enjoying it, I'll stop doing it. There's no question about it. I, I just don't want to be that hanger on guy that we've both seen uh, throughout our, our careers, whether it's playing, whether it's managing, whatever it is that, you know, that guy just doesn't have that passion for it anymore. Um, I, I don't think I could do that to myself. Yeah. And it's like you said, you get to see different things. You get to interact with, 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 with this generation mm-hmm. of players. Do, do guys ever ask you any questions about it? Your playing time or, Thoughts? I mean, you're 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 around, you know, the guys and everything else. But do you ever see that, or is it just more of just the whole atmosphere has completely changed? You know, so when we were playing TV guys, they'd be down there, we'd be down there, just hanging out, listening to them. You know, even guys yeah, that I that's, so even guys from the other from the other team, the other broadcast team. Uh, that's because we knew them and we knew they were players. Uh, I don't think most of the players know that I used to play, and it's just kind of funny uh, that they don't know. Uh, but, and, you know, and I'm not that guy that's going to go down there and say, Hey, I did this and I did that. No, if you don't know who I am, I'm fine. That's cool. That's, that's good. The guys that do, yes, there are guys that come and ask me questions and, and, and talk, but that tends to be, you know, a veteran guy. Uh, now if he introduces, introduces me to a younger guy, then that younger guy will know. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, it, it's just, yeah, it, it's, it, it can be a humbling experience, but, I never really had that big of an ego anyway, but, uh, man, I, I had one, <laughs> I had one coach ask me, he said, uh, I guess you see, you know, he was seeing me around the, the cage a lot. And he asked me, so what do you do here? <laughs> and I just kind of, I just kind of laughed a little bit. <laughs> and what I, <laughs> man, Fantasy what I camp player. Do, I got drafted. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the ground screw in my suit. I'm, I'm, I'm taking care of the field. What I wanted to do was point up to the rafters in left field and, you know, point at those 95 or 96, 97, or 96, 98, 99 flags and say, oh, I kind of helped put those up. But he probably would have thought I actually helped put them up there <laughs> and hung them. So uh, all I could do was really laugh. And I just say, hey, I just I do the Rangers pre and post game. And, uh, I know a lot of times the pre and posts are in are, are on on TVs in the locker room, so you see those guys that you know the guys that are doing you know TV, the in game guys, and you know pre and post. <clears throat> but that was uh, that was pretty funny to me. It, it kind of like um, is is he really is this guy serious with this question? 
But uh, it was I got I got a kick out of it. I couldn't wait to tell Steve Buscemi about it when I got back up to the set, <laughs> and he almost fell over in his chair. So, uh, but man, yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of still a lot of younger guys that don't really know that that I played, and then uh, what I did while I was playing, playing all the different positions, and and uh, not just playing those positions, I I played them well. I've had this talk with Banny, yeah. you know, with. With the alumni, you know, the Rangers are big with the alumni stuff. And, mm-hmm. and he was always wanting us around and said, you know, as even as an athlete, you can't know where you're going till you know where you've been. And granted, there are guys right. that we see that uh, I mean, they look familiar. And then somebody introduced us. This is uh, such and such. Like Ray Fossey, right, For does stuff for Oakland. I mm-hmm. you know, knew the name, but I never really can see the face. And all of a sudden, it was one of those where, hey, you know, Pete Rose killed you in the 76 All-Star <laughs> in the All-Star game, right, right? right? And that's the stuff that you, that you remember, but you're able to have that conversation, you know, and respect that, that they had for that um, and seeing that. But like you said, mm-hmm. for guys to come in and just look at you, not, and not what the hell's going on, it it just shows you're not really, yeah. you're just there for, for the business side of it, right? If it's, if you're going to do, do it, you do it all, right? Yeah, watch him, watch him I, you know, that's ball. kind of philosophy I, I had too, you know, and still have. It, it's kind of weird for me because when I was growing up, we got one game of baseball on TV a week. And that was Saturday, big Saturday baseball game of the week. And that was Saturday afternoon, 12, one o'clock, depending on where they, where they were playing or even 11 o'clock. Cause I, I grew up in San Diego on the West coast. So getting those East coast games, I knew every player in the big leagues, every team, American league, national league. And I traded cards or I was actually the middleman between my two older brothers stealing my cards and trading them for better ones. And then I got all the junk ones, but uh, you know, so knowing who all the players were, uh, it's just something you, you know, back then we did, and it was a lot tougher than it is now where every game is on. Uh, You can even go back and pull up old games and, you know, so not to know what the history of baseball is. And that's not necessarily saying, you know, yes, they all should know who I am or what. No, that's not what it is. But just knowing where, why you're where you are now. There were guys before you that did this, that helped things uh, along the way get to the point that they're at now. So, um, you know, and that was one of the things that I, that I ran into when I was retiring, uh, even, you know, 20 years ago, guys not knowing the past. Uh, I remember we were pulling, I was with Oakland and we were pulling into the hotel in Minnesota. You know, it's six, seven o'clock in the evening and the sun's still out and there's a guy standing out in front of the hotel in Minnesota and my heart just started racing because I recognized this guy immediately. And to my dismay, everybody on both buses walked right past this guy. And didn't say a word, not one word. And when I got to him, I walked up to him and I said, I said, Mr. Bench, I'm Mark McElmore. It's really great to meet you. Wow. And yes. And you know what I said? In my mind, really quickly, Johnny Bench knows who I am. I was like, oh my God, I turned into a six year old. It's like, Johnny Bench knows who I am. And, you know, we talked for about five minutes. And whoever was left in the lobby by the time I got in there, oh, you better believe they got an earful. They got an earful. I told them they need to go back outside and introduce yourself to one of the best catchers in the game ever. Uh, so, and probably was still playing by then, but yes, he had already, you know, surpassed that. But still, that is one of the great, and he was the greatest uh, up until this little kid, somebody, you know, you guys may have heard of Pudge. Yeah. Yeah, and that's and you're right though. That's that's the, what's missing from it. So you know, as a kid, you talk about collecting baseball cards. I didn't collect. I collected a little bit. I was more into collecting hockey and basketball cards. But the guys that I grew up watching, you know, Mike Schmidt was my favorite player growing up. I got a chance to sit down with him here in Arlington at an autograph signing and just talk. Down to earth guy, you know, just very personable wow. guy. That generation seems to be, you know, very, very personable. So who was that when you were playing, when you were a kid, the, the one guy that you wanted to meet just to just to be almost where the stars struck, oh my gosh, type of was there one guy that you got a chance to meet and, and be around, or was that just somebody that you you know, some guys they're the guys that they grew up are they no longer here? Oh no, I, I have quite a few. Um I would probably say the one that 
well, a lot of them stand out the most. It's, it's, it's hard to pick one, but I'll tell you a couple of them. One was I, I, the first time I came face to face with Dave Winfield. He was with the Padres and I had a, a coach, my high school coach was the Padres uh, bullpen catcher when they, for home games. So he would take myself and one of my teammates, Sam Horn, out uh, to whatever camp they had. He would get us tickets to go you know, watch these guys play because he recognized that uh, we both loved baseball and we could play and we would probably get drafted. But I was 12. and or, Yeah, I was 12. And Dave Winfield comes over. He's handing the bat to me, his bat, which was probably bigger than me at the time. And I stood there and I froze. I couldn't speak. I couldn't reach for the bat. So my teammate, Sam Warren, reaches over me. He grabs the bat and takes it. And I couldn't say a word to Dave Winfield. Now, let's fast forward 10 years. And Dave Winfield is now my teammate. Uh, That was telling him that story. He just, I mean, just fell out laughing. He said, I don't know what you were afraid of. I was trying to give you a bat. He didn't remember the incident, but, you know, I told him I was, you know, he was handing me a bat and I, I was so shocked I couldn't take it. And he just got a kick out of that story. Um, I met Ozzy Smith in high school. Uh, he was a neighbor of one of my, uh, of one of my teachers. And she asked him to come to our class or come to her class and, and speak. So um, she made sure that I met him and got to talk to him and said, hey, this young man, he can play baseball. You know, she told him, I'll keep your eye out. I mean, everybody says that. And so he was one of the first guys I met and got to play against him uh, before he retired. And then Gary Templeton uh, was another one. So those were two or three of my idols that I got to meet early on. And Gary Templeton, his mother-in-law lived in the same condo complex that I did when I was uh, in the minor leagues coming up uh, to the Angels uh, in LA. And man, um, she heard that I was a baseball player and was playing for the Angels and the minor leagues or whatever. She said, well, yeah, Gary, you know, he's my son-in-law. He comes over all the time. Next time he comes over, I'll make sure to, uh, you know, tell him, you know, go, come over there and say hi. So I'm like just excited. So every single day from that point on, I would be out in, in, in my garage and I'd have the door up. But I, ha- I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be at the front of the garage because then, you, you know, you could see, you know, somebody sitting there and driving by. So I backed my chair up so he w- couldn't really see if, you know, there was somebody there staring at him, waiting for him to come through. <laughs> so <laughs> I was creeping, man. I was creeping big time. So about five or six days, I see his car. And listen, I was doing this for like, I mean, from eight to 12 every morning until I saw him the next time. And uh, he comes driving through and I'm like, Oh my God, there he is. So I get up and I, I'm, creeping and I get, you know, kind of peek out of the, you know, out of, out of my garage and look, you know, looking down there, you know, and his mother-in-law came out and, you know, started talking to him. And next thing I know, he turns and he starts coming to my garage. I'm like, Oh my God. Oh my God. He's, he's coming over here. She did. She told him, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And so I went and sat down, you know, and just trying to be cool. And, you know, he pops around <laughs> <laughs> And, and we just, you know, we just chopped it up for a few minutes. He said, Hey, when you get to spring training, you know, I'll take you out to dinner and, you know, this and that and the other. And man, when he left, I went and got on the phone, tried to call all my brothers and tell them, Hey, I just met Gary Templeton. Of course, none of them answered there at work. I'm the only one who was a bum, uh, wasn't working yet. Uh, so, uh, we get to spring training. <laughs> And the Angels spring training back then was a little bit different. The first two weeks we were in Mesa, Arizona. So we were, you know, in the Arizona league, but we didn't have any home games because we didn't have a home stadium. We had uh, just practice field. So we were always the visiting team the first two weeks. And then we would move our camp to Palm Springs. And so all the teams would come to us for a series. And we always started the first uh, series with San Diego Padres. They would come over Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We play them, and lo and behold, I see Gary. You know, during batting practice, he said, "Hey, I'm gonna come get you. I'm only gonna play a couple innings today, but I'll wait around, and, or I'll come, I'll come pick you up from the hotel, and uh, we'll go. You know, we'll go, we'll go. You know, grab some dinner." So my family was still in San Diego at the time, so it was only you know a couple hour drive. So they drove over to see me play in my first you know big league camp. And, uh, after the game was over. 
you know, normally we would go to dinner or just hang out or whatever. I told everybody, my brothers too, for sure. Uh, listen, I'm gonna catch up with you guys later, but uh, Gary Temple just going to take me to dinner. So I'll, I'll catch you guys a little bit later on. All right. <laughs> and they were like, what? Who? When? Are you, are you serious? Yes. And so, you know, I played it like that. Yeah. I'm going to go to, go to, go to have, have dinner with Tempe. So, you know, I'll catch y'all later. <laughs> I played it like that. Like I knew it, <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it was just as rewarding for my brothers as it was for me, because I learned how to play the game from them. So uh, them getting to meet him, that was, that was pretty cool for me. Just being able to, um, I guess, provide that opportunity for them. Yeah. So yeah, those are, those, those are my guys, man. So getting, getting, to the point where I, I became friends with them and still talk to them to this day. Uh, that's that, that, that makes me feel pretty good. Yeah. It's getting the chance to meet your heroes and just letting them have an effect on you as a player, right. For, you know, just, just yeah, growing up, sure. you know, seeing these guys, I, I met Johnny bench when we were 12 playing in the little league Eastern regional final. He came out and talked to us, you know, you knew who he was. I never saw him play. I was too young, but just to be able to, to know that, that's Johnny Bench, right? You know the name Johnny Bench. You've seen that. And then playing with oh, yeah. guys. Um, I had a poster of Frank Thomas up there. Got a chance to, and then meeting Big Frank uh, and seeing these guys. But you know what I mean? And you're on the same field with them. But it's amazing what it does yeah. to us as athletes to see the guys that we grew up playing or growing up watching, wanting to be on the same field with. And then all of a sudden, you know, you know, here we are. This, these are the guys that you're around. Your teammate. Yes. Do I even belong Your teammate, here, right? Yeah. And that's the thing. And then become a friend. Yes, exactly. And and that's the beauty of it, right? I mean, the guys we see now yeah. um, around, you know, we see Pudge, we see Rafi, we see, you know, Kenny Rogers, guys like that, Alex, that I played with. Just the guys are just, they're, yes, they're they're super sad, but they're still down to earth, you know, just like we are, right? We get together, Mac, like you talk about, we just sit there and chop it up and have a good time and joke around. And, and that's the beauty of it. I think that's the one good thing the Rangers have done with the alumni here is just letting us get together and have fun you know jack does a good job of the golf so we see a lot of these guys and uh and, and the yeah. effect and the impact we can have on the, the the younger generation the next generation to see so um you know like you said that story talk you know that just helps somebody to see that that's somebody i want to be like right and here you are with him you know you get a chance now to to, to see those guys um when you're you know with, with the teams that are in town and, and different stuff and and still learning through it mm-hmm. You know, but having fun, fun doing. I think that fun's been taken out yeah. of the game, and maybe it's up to these this this older generation, these guys, these managers coming in, Bochi coming in here, Mad Dog Pitch and Coach, to kind of change that philosophy mm-hmm. a little bit. So I mean, you'll you'll see it firsthand uh, when when they go out in spring training and and uh, when the team breaks to see. But you know, I'll, I'm looking forward to baseball this year uh, and and how it's yeah. how it progresses. But hopefully, we can get back to when we played our style of baseball, right? The, the little things, doing the little stuff. So, um, you know, it's it, it'll be interesting yeah. to see for sure. Uh, uh, yeah, and it, see. Will. it will be. I, I, I'm excited about the season. I really am. And, you know, you mentioned, you know, thing about, you know, the little things. To me, you know, you hear, you know, small ball all the time. To me, it's that's just baseball. Mm-hmm. That's part of it. Being able to move that runner over, driving them from third base with less than two outs. Uh, that's just baseball. It doesn't mean that it's, you know, something, you know, minuscule. Now, those 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 little things that they all add up to big things. And so uh yeah, I, I hope we do see a lot more of it. I, I definitely want to see um, you know, stolen base come back and, and be more prevalent in today's game because I think speed is lacking. I don't think I don't think a lot of people understand what speed does to a defense. It puts pressure on them. And that's what you want. You want to apply as much pressure as you possibly can to the opponent. So that's just one aspect of it. So hopefully that come back a little bit. Yeah, it'll, it'll be it'll be interesting for sure to see. You know, you just hope that each year it evolves, and uh, with with this with with what it is the 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 table setters get back to the table mm-hmm. setters what you got. So, um, but you know, you guys get a chance to see Mac this year on on TV pre and post game for the Rangers. And uh, anything else you're doing these days other than that, Mark? Just playing some golf and that's it. Just TV stuff. You know I'm not playing golf. <laughs> no golf, man. Just TV stuff uh, and trying not to get too fat. Uh, my son likes to likes to bake and cook, and I end up being the, the taster a lot of times. And sometimes when he doesn't even realize it, I'm the one going in there getting the cookies and the cake. And he'll be like, "I thought I made more than that." 
You're like me, dude. You got a weight problem. I can't wait to eat. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> man, Mac, well, I appreciate you jumping on today, man, and, and and just just talking, chopping it up. Like I said, having a good time, and we'll definitely have to do this again. Um, yeah, like man, I said, I I'll it, see man. you around town all the time. On, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Like I said, get a chance yeah. to listen to Mac this year, and uh, is Booze on there with you, right? Yeah, most most of the time it's me and Boo. Uh, but sometimes I'll have uh, uh, Mike Bastic with me and David Murphy. But okay. most of the time it's Boo and I together. Gotcha. See, the stories and stuff that people can tell with those guys. So, oh, yeah. But, man, we appreciate you jumping on here, Mac. And uh, All right, like I said, we'll, we'll be in touch, I'm sure. I'll, you know I'll see you around for sure. So I you appreciate it. it, man. Always. I'll be in touch. Thanks, All Mac. Right, I appreciate it.